As we go to God's Word this morning, let's pray. Father, as we come before your throne of grace, as we go to your Word, speak to us, Father, from the holy pages of your Scripture, that the words from on high might find lodging in our hearts and in our lives, Father, in such a way as to draw us into a closer relationship with you and to transform us and our characters into a closer reflection of you. We ask in Christ's precious name, amen. It's an incredible time of year, isn't it? I like summer. I like summer up to about 94 degrees. And all of you that have been enjoying the 104 and 105, you know what I'm referring to. I like this time of year for another reason. Because one weekend after another, people in our congregation and across our city and across our state are doing something. They're graduating. Graduating from kindergarten, elementary school, mid-school, high school, college, master's degree, and doctoral degrees. And we have some among us who, before we finish our worship service, uh, we're going to congratulate. In the scriptures, scriptures are rather salient, and in sometimes, in just a few words, they say so much. Do you believe that, friends? Sometimes it takes it takes pages and volumes and volumes and volumes to explain a concept. And sometimes it can be done in just a few sentences. And so our primary verse today, our primary anchoring verse today was very simple. A man found a pearl of great price. And what did he do once he had found that pearl? He went home and sold all that he had, that he might find and buy that field in which he had found the pearl of great price. And having accomplished that, he had his pearl of great price. So today, I would just ask you to reflect a little bit. What is most important in your life? And how intentional are you for seeking that which is most important? Our worship and teaching today is entitled Searching for Diamonds. It's kind of a baccalaureate message. It's an amazing thing, Google, the search engine, isn't it? In 0.004 seconds, it gave me the definition of baccalaureate, of which I was glad to read on one hand and rather taken back on the other. One of the first sentences of the definition said, it's a short worship message, historically ranging from 30 minutes to four hours. You caught why I was glad, and you caught why I was going, oh my goodness. I was glad because the shorter side was probably 30 minutes and not the four hours. We live in a generation which tries to communicate hardly any more by paragraphs and pages. They do it by text messaging. A hundred and how many characters? 140 characters. If you can't say it in 140 characters, my mind is on to something else. So I've got good news for you today. This is a text message message. It's not the page and paragraphs in four hours. All right? Searching for diamonds. Have you ever gone in search for something? Diamonds, oil, gold. Wouldn't you like to find something that was worth something on public land so you could take it home? I cut out and hold in my hand. I cut out and hold in my hand an image 
of the largest, uh, most valuable diamond in the world. I wasn't able to obtain the actual piece to show you and display today. But as you can see, it would fit in my hand. Wouldn't it be amazing to go on a walk and find it in an open field today? For, for instantly, it indeed would be life-changing and transforming. Worth over $350 million today easily fits in your hand. I'll guarantee you won't be displaying it on your end table, probably at home. You would have it locked up some place safe. It seems, though, that oftentimes we go in search for diamonds in one form or another through life, doesn't it? We go in search for something greater that is sometimes just beyond our reach. It's out there, we believe. And if we search long enough and hard enough and with most diligence, somehow, one day, we will find it. It's good to go in search. Today, I want to share with you two stories of going in search. I share with you two stories on this baccalaureate because of all the people that I have heard, uh, spoken with, I, and I've asked, can you tell me what your baccalaureate address was about? To a person, they go, mm, I don't remember. But I'm going to share with you a story that I hope will linger in your mind long after today. So if you are a graduate graduating today, whether it's from elementary school, preschool, graduate school, or beyond high school, I, I want you to listen carefully because it has some unusual twists and turns. The story is entitled Acres of Diamonds. The classical form written by Russell uh, Conwell is 40 pages long. That indeed is the four-hour story. You will receive the first four or five pages of an abridged and edited version of the story. He writes, when traveling down the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers many years ago with a party of English travelers, I found myself under the direction of an old Arab guide whom we hired up out of Baghdad. And I've often thought how that guide resembled one of our barbers in certain characteristics. He thought it was not only his duty to guide us down the rivers and do what he was paid for doing, but to entertain us with stories that came to him through his lifespan. Some were curious, weird, ancient, and modern, strange and familiar. Many of them I have forgotten, but I am glad I have. There is one that I shall never forget. The old guide leading my camel by its halter along the banks of those ancient rivers told me a story and story after story until I grew weary of his storytelling. I just wish he would not tell me one more story. He had a way of engaging us when he thought we weren't listening. He would take off his cap and whirl it in the air as if he was going to just send it our way. And he would gain our attention as he would try to intrigue us with another story. I could see that Turkish cap being swung near my head to try to gain my attention once again. I was determined not to look at him, just to try to distance myself enough that he would not start, but to no avail. It was almost as if he was commanding me and my attention for one more 
story. I will tell you a story now, he said, which I reserve for particular friends. When he emphasized the particular friends, he caught my ear. It must be his best story, I thought to myself. I listened, and I've been ever glad since that I did. I really feel devoutly thankful because over the years it has blessed 1,674 college students with the proceeds of that which I have received for telling the story to go to college tuition free. So here is the story the old guy told me. There once lived not far the river from the river Indias, an ancient Persian by the name of Ali Hafed. He said that Ali owned a very large farm. He had orchard, grain fields, and gardens. He had all of his money invested in interests and was wealthy and content. One day he was visited by an old Persian. Uh, one day that old Persian farmer was visited by an ancient wise man from the east who sat down by the fire and told the old farmer how this old world of ours was made. And the old ancient mystic said it happened something like this. There was a huge bank but bank of fog that covered the orb that was on fire as it was spinning through space with increasing speed until that bank of fog whirled into a ball that could not be stopped. And when it rolled through the universe, eventually the fire burned out and the, the fog bank was an orb that cooled down. And on the hot surface, the outward crust cooled first. And quickly it cooled, and the crust of that, that foggy bank was first filled with granite. Less quickly, copper cooled. Less quickly, silver. Less quickly, gold. After that, the diamonds were formed. Out of drops from the sun they glistened. A diamond is a concealed, congealed drop of the sunlight, the old ancient mystic said. Now that is literally scientifically true that a diamond is an actual deposit of carbon from the sun, he said. The old ancient mystic told Alfred that if he had one diamond the size of his thumb, he would be a very, very rich man, the richest man in the county. And if he had a diamond the size of his fist, his children would sit on, th his children would sit on thrones of wealth and be rulers with their great wealth. The old ancient mystic told Ali that he knew where the fields and acres of diamonds were. Ali went to bed, a very troubled man that night. He was wealthy in the morning and very poor that night. Nothing had changed but what he desired rather than what he had. He thought all night long about finding that acre of diamonds. He couldn't sleep because now he was poor. He was concentrating and was very discontent and disoriented. He said to himself, I want those diamonds. And he lay awake all night longing to talk to that mystic once again. In the morning, 
he had his opportunity to talk to the mystic. He said, friend, will you tell me where that acre of diamonds is? The mystic said, yes, I most certainly will. He said, why shall I tell you? He said, I wish to be immensely rich. Well, then go along and find them. That is all you need to do. Go and find them, and then you will have them. But I don't know where to go, Allie, Allie said. Well, you'll find, you'll find a river that runs through white sands between the high mountains. And in the white sands, sands you will find the diamonds that you are searching for. I don't believe there's any such river. Oh, yes, there is. There's plenty of them. All you have to do is go and find them. Ali said to himself, I will go. He sold his farm, collected his money, left his farm, left his family in charge of his neighbors to be tended for while he went in search of diamonds. He began his search very promptly uh, to his mind the mountains of the moon, after he came around to Palestine. Then he wandered on into Europe, and at last, with all of his money spent, he was in rags and wretchedness and poverty. He stood on the shore of the bay in Barcelona, Spain, when a great tidal wave came rolling in. As he was standing in the waves, the tidal wave took him, out to sea. Poor, afflicted, suffering, dying man, he did not resist the pull of the tidal wave and sank beneath its forming crest, never to rise again. Then the old guide told me that awful sad story. He stopped the camel I was riding and went back to fix the baggage that was coming off another camel, and I had opportunity to muse over the story that he was saving for his particular friends from the East. I remember saying to myself, why did he reserve a story for his particular friends that seemed to have no beginning, no middle, and no end or purpose or meaning to it? It seemed to be the first chapter of a book. And that's all that I would receive. It did not make sense to me. The next day, as we, as we proceeded, he told us the second chapter that continued something like this. The man who had purchased Allied's farm one day led his camel into the garden to drink. And as the camel came, uh, put its nose into the shallow water by the garden brook, Ally's successor noticed with curious curiosity a flash of light from the white sands of the stream. He pulled back a black stone, having an eye of light reflecting all kinds of bright colors in use. He took the pebble into his house and put it on the mantle which covers the central fires in the home, and he forgot all about it. A few days later, the old mystic from the east came to visit his old friend ally to say hello. As he opened the door, knocked on the door, the successor who bought the farm welcomed him in to greet him. And he asked, where is ally? Ali, he said, I have purchased the farm from him. The sunlight glistened over the mantle, which drew the mystic's eyes. And he said, that's a beautiful gem you have there. The owner didn't know what to say, because the old mystic shouted, Why, here's a diamond. Has Ali returned? Oh, no, Ali has not returned. That is not a diamond. It's nothing but a stone we found right here out of our own garden. But the mystic said, I, 
I tell you, I know a diamond when I see it. And I know positively that that is a diamond. They together rushed out to the old garden and stirred up the white sands with their fingers some more. There came up, one after the other, fistfuls of very small diamonds of different brightness and different clarities. The most magnificent diamond mind in all of history of mankind excelling itself right in the backyard of valley. When the old Arab guy told me the second chapter of his story, he then took off his Turkish cap and swung it around in the air once again to ga gather my attention carefully for the moral of the story. Those old Arab guides, er, er, excuse me, those Arab guides have morals to their stories, although they are not always moral. As he swung his hat, had Ali, remain, Ali remained at home and dug his own cellar and underneath his own wheat fields or in his own garden, instead of going in search for something that was always a long way off, he would have had the diamonds that were in his own back yard. Searching for diamonds. Sometimes we go in search for those things the world over. Sometimes we go in search for those things that are right next to us. Sometimes we go in search for those things that are so elusive, always just outside of our reach when in reality they are right in our own backyard. So I'd like to challenge you today to re reflect with me for just a few moments about that which is most important in your lives. They are not the diamonds of wealth. They are not the diamonds of riches, but the diamonds that are most important in our lives, I believe, friends, is our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the pearl of great price, of the friends that we have, and our families. So when you go in, in search of searching for those diamonds, of those things that are of most important. All of your education will make you filled with knowledge, but may not make you wise. Some will disagree with me on that piece. But knowledge and wisdom are not the same. For knowledge will tell you two plus two equals something. They will fill your head with knowledge, but how you apply it is the discernment of wisdom. When you go in search of that which you may want and desire, make sure it is in search of those things that God wants you to have. For indeed, they may be in your own backyard.